A U.S. college student was arrested in the California synagogue shooting. The suspect of the shooting, John Ernest, was reportedly inspired by the New Zealand mosque killings. Joining me now to talk about it is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari. Lisa, the rabbi of the synagogue, says the gunman's weapon jammed, which actually prevented a bloodbath. Yeah, can you imagine? The rabbi is looking on the bright side of things today uh, and looking at the situation as it, as it could have been much worse. You think about the vulnerability of worshipers and their in their place of sanctity and their place of peace uh, gathered. Not only was it the Sabbath, it was also the last day of Passover gathered in the Chabad house uh, in Southern California. The last thing on their minds is that someone who hates them with such a deep-seated uh, emotion of hate would come in there and try to take their lives. Uh, awful, awful, and this is happening way too often. Uh, and unfortunately, the conversation uh, the, in the days that follow are about Donald Trump and about gun control, but not about this, this resurgence of anti-Semitism and hate and uh, all over. I mean, whether you talk about the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting or even New Zealand, it was a mosque shooting. But where does this hate come from and what can we do to combat it? And that should be the, the, the ultimate or the larger conversation in, in situations like this to prevent them from happening again and again. You know, we had a recent report saying that anti-Semitism is on the rise here in Canada. More than 2,000 cases of harassment, vandalism and violence took place last year. Now, Lisa, the New York Times is getting in on the action. They got into a problem recently when they ran an anti-Semitic cartoon involving Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu. Tell me more about that. This cartoon was awful. If you were able to, to see it, it it's, it's truly anti-Semitic. There's no other way to, I mean, if you didn't know anything else, and I showed you this cartoon, you'd think it came from a Nazi magazine of the 40s uh, and late 30s. Uh, it's, it's horrific. Uh, and uh, the way that it's portrayed, and when you think about the, the New York Times and how difficult it is to get an op-ed in there, to get you know a cartoon in there, to get an, a column in there, this doesn't just happen. This isn't just something that, you know, an intern slipped in there and it got published. This is systematic. Uh, and, you know, the apologies come. But, you know, how much of this can we can we tolerate as a society? And this is 2019. I mean, uh, to have groups not feel comfortable and to have the mainstream media portray our president uh, in, in this way, I mean, on the one hand, they call him an anti-Semite and they say that the, the, the shooting in San Diego happened because of him. And on the other, they say, you know, he's being pulled by, by the Jewish uh, lobby or Netanyahu or, you know, he's owned by the Jews or whatever this cartoon was trying to depict. So which one is it? Uh, and the mainstream media has this way of just, you know, through emotion, uh, trying to really change the minds of, of, of readers and, and, again, where are the facts? Uh, fake news prevails, and it's an ugly, ugly thing when um, you know a, a minority group like the Jews, who have been so comfortable living in the United States and have you know uh, played such a role, whether it's in medicine or technology or business, and really consider themselves Americans uh, first and foremost, have to take a step back and say, "Are we really welcome here? Are we really safe here? Uh, do we really belong here?" And it's an awful feeling. And as you said, it's on the rise. Uh, here in the United States as well. In 2017, there was an exponential jump in cases. Uh, and, I, and as you said, in Canada as, as well. So no more justifications, no more blaming of, of anything. I mean, we have to get to the root of this and have, have this stop. You know, it's terrible. I've seen the cartoon as well. It's uh, Donald Trump blind and Netanyahu is his, his blind dog. You know, he's pulling him along. It's just, it's terrible. You think to yourself, you know, you and I are both journalists, and these guys need to be held accountable, the New York Times. But at the same time, we know that print is suffering right now. They're hurting. It's all about selling papers, isn't it, for them? It is. It, to them, it, it is. But it's also about being, you know, I always say it's, it's a news business and not a news service, right? So they're more after making that dollar than, uh, you know, th than, than telling the truth, which is such a sad reality for, for everyone, for journalists and, 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 and news consumers alike. Uh, which is why I always, I mean, I just did a TED Talk on fake news and how to actually get real news. And, and the bottom line is you have to go to multiple sources uh, in order to even get half the truth, uh, if, if that's even being put out there. But uh, here in this country, we have an epidemic because the, the desire to paint the president, and again, 
this country will suffer because this president will be out of office, whether it's first term or second term. When he leaves office, the, the, uh, the, uh, the post of, of the president of the United States will be a diminished post because of all this disrespect, because of the way that they, the media now treats the White House, the way that the, um, the you know, fake news it got, has gone rampant in order to paint such an ugly picture, uh, where they trust you know, uh, the gunmen or ISIS or you know, the Iranian regime or Syria more than they trust the, the, the president of the United States. And when you're trying to uh, have that kind of bottom line, and when, you're, when your goal is to really smear an individual rather than tell the, the accurate facts, then we're never going to get down to to, the, to what's really going on. We're never going to protect our national security. We're never going to really get the truth on our economy. We're never going to get the truth on, on many other things. So we're suffering as a nation because of it. And I know you feel that in, in Canada and in Mexico, our neighbors feel this. Uh, we're stronger and we're stronger together. Uh, and when the U.S. is diminished, the entire world truly is diminished. And Ronald Reagan got that very well. And, and you'd hope that you know, um, nowadays, the media, the entire, you know, um, White House, that it would be better understood that, that if we prosper, we prosper together. Lisa, a recent report from the BBC says one of the key suspects in the Sri Lankan Easter attacks, Zaran Hashim, was killed. Investigators are probing the extent of Islamic State involvement in the Sri Lankan blasts. Right. So uh, if we kind of rewind to, to last week when the Sri Lankan uh, attack occurred, uh, first there was a like, local group that took responsibility and all eyes were on these few individuals. But then ISIS as a whole took responsibility. So now the question is, to what extent does ISIS play a role in local attacks? And to what extent do they just dictate or kind of pass it off? Uh, and find recruits locally and say, we need you to, 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 to take care of business. Uh, regardless, we know that there was a local cell that was growing and where a lot of these uh, extremists were, were congregating and living in one place. What's also surprising in this particular case is that many of these suicide bombers, and again, suicide bombers usually come from the lowest socioeconomic brackets. They're desperate. They need that check to feed their families. Many of them came from educated and wealthy families. So what possesses an individual to want to strap a bomb onto their body and end their lives and end the lives of others uh, when, when they do come from that type of a background, being educated, having all the means in the world, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of questions that need to be answered here, and that's why you have all these different investigations to see the extent of ISIS and its tentacles in Sri Lanka and that part of the world. We talk about ISIS dying down in Syria and Iraq. Where are they growing? Uh, we look at these types of families. We, we generally don't look at these types of families as, as, as targets uh, for recruitment. It's usually, again, those that are suffering and, and need that kind of uh, th those kinds of resources. So again, a lot of, of investigation going on here and a lot of questions that remain unanswered. Twitter has always been known for a place where you find many trolls, people who love to argue. You and I have known that personally <laughs> as well. It's also a place where police have been finding online extremism, which has led to many arrests. Let's talk more about that. Yes, and again, the question being, when these extremists are, are being taken out on the uh, out of the battlefield, where are they going? And the answer always is on social media, where they have been the most successful with regards to growth and recruitment and getting their propaganda um, spread like wildfire, whether it's on the web or even on the dark web, where they can hide even better. So the the challenge for social media platforms, and these are again American platforms that can and are private. Uh, entities uh, in taking down these um, accounts is that needle in a haystack. There are so many of these accounts. Uh, for example, when um, today the news came out that this uh, Poway, the, the San Diego uh, area synagogue shooter, uh, his case was referred to the FBI about five minutes before he carried out that shooting. Now, how was that? even found, well, his, his manifesto was on his Facebook page. He didn't say where and he didn't say when, but how can authorities be sure that this is not a hoax? How can they really allocate their uh, resources to these what could be false alarms? And then if they do take every single one of these threats seriously, how do they act upon them without any more evidence or any more information? So 
it's very, very daunting, but they're coming even with more frequency uh, onto social media. And again, how do you differentiate between a fanboy or fangirl and an, an actual uh, you know, perpetrator, somebody who's going to carry out that crime or, or that terrorist attack. So it's it's very daunting. It's it's extremely, extremely difficult and challenging. But I, um, I, I would like to believe that these social media companies are on it and they do consider this a priority right now. Absolutely. Diplomatic tensions are on the rise between Canada and China over the arrest of the Huawei executive and the embargo on Canadian canola. Now, Lisa, tensions are rising also between the U.S. and China on aggressive acts by fishing boats. Yes. You know, uh, China is very innovative, and we know that in, in many ways, whether it's their products and their technology or the way in ways in which they have tried to uh, use espionage tactics to get uh, technology secrets um, and other secrets uh, and use them against us here in the West. And the U.S. Has, has recently become more cognizant of the fact that we have to watch out, whether it's this woman who walked onto Mar-a-Lago with a uh, USB and, and other types of uh, technology. What was she trying to do? What was she, um, you know, who, who hired her, who put her there? Uh, how did she get there, et cetera? Uh, to these fishing boats that have been going on and, 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 and drifting into areas where they shouldn't, to other types of espionage, uh, trying to collect information, trying to use copycat tactics in, uh, in, in patented technology, et cetera. So we know that they're up to no good. And again, that trade deal, if it goes through, it will all depend on uh, in enforcement of that deal and enforcement and, and, and China really policing itself to act better and do better by the West if they want to play in the big boys league, uh, in the economy, in the, on the world stage, et cetera. If they want to normalize relations, they have to be behaving much better. You know, I'm glad you brought up the trade deal, Lisa. Word from the World Economic Forum says both the U.S. and China need to show a little bit of flexibility when it comes to trade talks. Tell me more about that. You know, whenever there's no resolution, uh, that's what can be said. Both sides need to be more flexible. You can say that about our married couple, and you can say that about North Korea and the U.S., and you can say that about China and the U.S. We're not coming to any resolution. So, yes, both sides have to concede more. Both sides have to be more flexible. I think what we're seeing here is that... Uh, the, the U.S. has definitely more leverage. The Chinese are playing along because they want this deal, but the U.S. has some non-negotiables. And again, that being uh, that China has to play by some rules, and China has not used to playing by rules. If you remember when Donald Trump was just a guest on random talk shows on Fox News and in other places, he was not even a candidate yet. His biggest platform and his biggest you know, aha moment about how to fix US, the US economy with regards to trade was to curb China. He, has, he, he was saying it until he was blue in the face. And then he became a candidate and he ran on that platform. And then he became President Trump and he still continues uh, on, on this belief that we truly have to curb the Chinese in order to get a good deal out of them. So I think we have them in a place because of all the tariffs that they we believe, or Donald Trump believes by his calculation, that they will come to the table and they will have to concede. So when we talk about flexibility, we're hoping that China shows some of that flexibility so we can all be put out of our misery and go forward and have a deal with China. Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Zarif is accusing the United States of trying to bring Iran to its knees and overthrow its government by seeking to thwart its international oil trade, Lisa. Yes, if you were able to catch any of uh, Foreign Minister Zarif's media tour, uh, he did the Sunday shows this weekend, uh, and he continues to go around. He speaks almost perfect English, and he continues to deceive. This is a man who has blood on his hands. He represents the Iranian regime, which has blood on its hands. And he is going around pointing fingers and saying, well, it might not be Donald Trump who wants to confront the, the Iranian regime. It might not be him who's going to be lured into something of an escalation with Iran. But those around him, including John Bolton and the Saudis and Israel, those characters are pushing him and influencing him in a way that they shouldn't. So a lot of diplomatic talk. Uh, a lot of blaming, but, you know, when he was pushed back on a lot of questions regarding human rights, regarding the Iranians back at home, you know, the irony of it all is that he comes here, he uses our First Amendment uh, to say anything he wants to say, but back at home, Iranians are taken off of Facebook, taken off of Twitter, taken off of Instagram, arrested for their blog posts and what they, what they say or write or publish 
Uh, and, you know, the hypocrisy is just so loud and so eerie. But when are we going to see some changes from the Iranian regime? That's what sanctions are for. And we're hoping that that is the message here. The United States is not trying to punish the Iranian people. We stand by the Iranian people and the human rights abuses. Donald Trump has said that many, many, many times. And the sanctions are meant more so, even though they will affect the people, more so to curb the Iranian regime, to cut their oil sales, to cut the, the central banking system, and to perhaps uh, influence some, some real behavioral change over there. Now, Iran says it may withdraw from the nuclear treaty after U.S. President Trump restored sanctions. Are people a little worried about that? You know, this is more uh, muscle flexing and saber rattling by the Iranian regime. They've been doing this for years. So, you know, in one breath, they'll say, well, it wasn't us who withdrew from the Iran deal. It was the Americans. And then in one breath, they'll say, well, we also can withdraw from 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 nuclear uh, treaties. And we we would have withdrawn from the deal anyway. And we don't want this. and We don't want that. So um, a, a lot of this chest thumping that we've seen from the Iranian regime, a lot of its propaganda, uh, and the truth is they're suffering. And the, the numbers and the, the economy uh, has, has truly um, been diminished to a place where they're suffering, and that, that just says it all. So the sanctions are working, and that's what, what they're meant to do. Lisa, we only have a few short moments left here. In other news, the United States and Turkey are playing chicken over Russia, and it has to do with Turkey's plan to purchase a missile defense system from Russia. Yes. Well, they've been playing footsie for a very long time. And, you know, everyone, especially Turkey, has been very equal opportunity about making new friends in the region and turning from the U.S. and, and, and turning to, to the U.S.'s enemies, including Iran uh, and Russia in this case. But the Russians are standing back and waiting for a reaction out of the United States. Will we enter into a new treaty is the question, or will Russia go rogue and buy a new, defense, new missile defense system, new uh, weapon system, uh, continue making these um, weird and awkward um, new alliances with, with Turkey and continue its relationship with North Korea and Venezuela and Iran and, you know, all of the rogue actors that, of course, the U.S. will not approve of. Uh, but again, uh, this is a different calculation that Donald Trump has, and he's waiting to see how he can curb the Russians in a different way. But, you know, I think maybe that the reason why this topic hasn't been broached by the White House yet is that they're waiting for all of the investigations to be cleared so that there's no connection between the White House and Russia from from previous investigations and we go forward and we have a clear foreign policy with Russia, which is what we, we need and we want. Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining me once again from Los Angeles. Thanks, Lisa. My pleasure.